It's been about six years since I started hearing the alarm bells that engineers were ringing about AI and its societal and ethical implications. I don't know how I came to hear about it, but somehow it was sort of, you know, in the air, and I heard it, and that's part of what explains how I got into doing what I do now. One of the things that I've witnessed over the years that I've been involved in this sort of space is that different companies, different people, government organizations try to figure out how to get their hands around AI ethics by first appealing to a set of principles, ethical principles. There's lots of these lists. I mean, there's literally, I don't know, over 200 of these lists or commitments to different ethical values by different organizations of every shape and size. The lists can contain various kinds of values. There's lots of overlap, though. So on almost all of them, you'll see things like fairness or justice, privacy, transparency, respect for autonomy, this sort of thing. The thing is, though, that when philosophers, when ethicists do ethics, if you like, we, we never, or at least we very rarely say, well, here's the principle of justice, and, and therefore here's how we should treat this particular case. It's just sort of not what we do. And interestingly, what I've seen is that a lot of companies and government organizations will come up with their list of principles, justice and fairness and privacy, whatever, and then they have no idea what to do. They just don't know what to do. I've had a number of people reach out to me to say, hey, Reed, we've gotten together in our organization, we've got our list of values, and now we want to implement those values, but we don't know how. They just don't know what to do with these principles or values. Perhaps one explanation for why they don't know what to do, because they're just doing the wrong sort of thing, that this approach, let's call it principalism, just doesn't work as an approach to getting your hands around AI ethics and actually making sure that AI is designed and developed and de built and deployed in ways that are on the ethical up and up. That's sort of the contention of Ami, who I'll talk to today. His claim is that principalism doesn't work. He articulates three main reasons why it doesn't work. And he really thinks that in order to do ethics well, we've got to do it, if you like, on the ground. We have to do it with the people who will be impacted by the systems, by the AI that we design. There's a lot more detail, of course, and I'll allow him to go into all of that. One thing that I wanted to highlight that is just sort of interesting because I'd never really thought about it before is about the function that ethicists are meant to play in this new world of AI ethics. I think there's a lot of things that they can do, but one thing that he pointed out that I had never heard of was ethicists, when I say ethicists, I mean people with PhDs in philosophy who specialize in ethics. They're particularly good and because they're trained to understand the value that is underlying the, the claim that someone has, the, the ethical claim that they're making. So in this conversation, you'll hear as the sort of backdrop is decisions about whether to deploy robots in healthcare settings. So for instance, for elderly care. And he said something like, you know, he's heard nurses say, well, I'm worried I'm not going to get enough face time with my patients. And so I don't want to have these robots. And one of the things that came out of the conversation that he had with nurses and other healthcare practitioners was what they were really saying when they were saying, I'm not going to spend enough face time with my patients is that's how I instantiate the value of caring for people. That's how I instantiate the value of caring about people. And once you can identify that underlying value, then you can have another kind of conversation, which is something like, well, maybe we do have these robots and maybe you do have less face time in some way, but maybe there's some other way of expressing that value of care for your patient. How else might this go? And so being able to sort of abstract from very concrete concerns to value-based concerns allows for a different kind of conversation. That's what Ami claims, and that's what he's practiced. So I thought that was particularly insightful. Okay, there's not much more by way of intro. Don't forget, you can always email me about topics you want me to discuss or people you want me to talk to, issues you want me to address, em at readblackman.com, as in ethicalmachines at readblackman.com. Please review the podcast. Five stars, share it with your friends, tell everybody about it, and that's all I got. Let's go talk to Ami. So you and Dave, who's not here, wrote this article called More Process, Less Principles, The Ethics of Deploying AI and Robotics in Medicine. 
So tell me, just tell me what you mean when you say more process, less principles. And let's put aside the fact that it's grammatically problematic. You don't say fewer principles, which drives me a little bit nuts, but okay, I'll give you that one. Go for it. Oh, you're going to start with that? <laughs> okay. I, well, let's, okay, let's. I mean, uh, come on, less principles, isn't that? No, because fewer principles would mean that the list contains too many principles and you need to whittle the list down to fewer principles. Okay. So what we're saying is less principled goals, meaning use, so don't use the principalist approach as much. I see. Okay. Okay. I can accept that. I suppose. Yeah, you're not the first person to say that. It's, I'm sure I'm not. I mean, you're, you're talking <laughs> it was deliberate. we're going to be pedantic. <laughs> it was, yes, it, it was, was deliberate. deliberate. Does that and make I it better or worse people. though? I, I feel like it makes it worse. Like, you know, hey. we did, we made it wrong on purpose. Is that better or worse than it was an accident? But that's the thing. It's not wrong. I know it's not. It's not wrong. Okay. <laughs> So tell me, so tell is, me. Here's the important thing. People actually noticed my article. And how often does that true. happen? How often does that happen philosophers? You know what? For now, I'm going to put uh, typos in my articles to get attention and, and, and the headlines. Anyway, <laughs> tell me, tell me <laughs> what the idea is. So first of all, you've already pointed out a problem, right? That there are principles involved. The problem that you've got with AI ethics or ethics in robotics and AI medicine is not the fact that there's a bunch of principles around. I imagine you mean the common ones like fairness and privacy and transparency and explainability and blah, blah, blah. You don't want to whittle them down. People are doing too much with them. So what does it even mean to, to do that? What does it mean to do too much with principles? I guess I want to focus on the criticism or the, or the weaknesses of principalism itself. So whether we use it for design, whether we use it to, for development, or whether we use it to, to, for deployment, I think principalism itself is incomplete. I won't say we need to throw it away. I'll, say, I'll say it's incomplete without process attached to it. Okay, so let's consider the case of deploying social robots, intelligent social robots in a care home. So first of all, the principalist approach doesn't tell us anything about who is going to apply the principles. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this matters because if I say, make sure you deploy it in a just way, even among philosophers, there's no agreement over what justice means, you know, going back all the way back to Socrates, sure. right? So, and even, even if you're an egalitarian about justice, even egalitarians don't agree about in what respects things should be equal. And so telling you know, principle that says that deployment should be just doesn't tell us what interpretation of justice we should use. And it doesn't tell us whose interpretation of justice we should use. And that's what we set out to address. All right. So but how's process going to fix any of this? So, okay. The complaint is a common one. The principles are too high level, too abstract, too generic to be directly applicable to any particular use case, because we've got to think about what constitutes just in this particular use case, and that's going to vary by a number of things. One, about the actual facts on the ground, so to speak, but also about what kinds of out outcomes we find or we judge to be just, fair, equitable, whatever you want. But I throw some procedures in there. Are the mm -hmm. procedures just about, okay, let's deliberatively, you know, collectively figure out what we think would constitute a just outcome in this particular use case or what would constitute a just process? Is that what the processes are meant to do? Right. So... That's a great question. So the processes are meant to yeah, co uh, compensate for the weaknesses of principalism itself. So I think it, it'll be important to just quickly go over the three that we identify in the paper. And these are not the like, th these are not anything that, you know, we're the first ones to say, you know, these are just kind of either in the air. So one is I've already alluded to what we call the ambiguity challenge. Right. So we talk about justice, beneficence, non-maleficence, you know, privacy. These are all very broad and abstract terms. And so, but you know, what justice means to somebody in Northern Thailand and what justice means to someone in Manhattan is not the same thing. Right. So we want to make sure that the interpretation of justice is context sensitive that the people who are subject to the policy decisions, 
that their interpretation, that their understanding of justice is the one that's in play, not the one that was developed by a bunch of academics, you know, that were you know, hired by the UN or by the EU or some other body. So, you know, regardless of whether you think justice or, you know, whether regardless of what you think should be on the list, there's still this problem of what is the correct understanding of this principle, right? Sure. And ideally you want it to be sensitive to the stakeholders involved in that decision, right? So that's number one. The second one is what we call the ranking challenge, right? And so any ethical system with more than one value will inevitably have situations where the values can Sure. And so you need some non, hopefully non ad hoc way of figuring out what do we do when these two values conflict. So you, yeah. you, you rarely so get like a free a lunch. Benevolence, you have like benevolence and, and respect to people's autonomy. Benevolence sure. encourages yeah. you All to, day long. to move to help. Right. Uh, respect for autonomy says keep your hands off. These things come into conflict sometimes. So how do you, how do you, how do you balance these things appropriately? Yeah. So here's, here's the thing, like situation A, we gave more weight to autonomy and situation B, we gave more weight to beneficence. Why? Right. Sure. So you need some sort of justification for why you are weighing one value more in one situation and less in another. So you need yeah. to justify the order, the order in which you rank the values that are in play. Sure. And then yeah. the third problem is what we call the tacit exclusion problem. So like I said, when you walk into an ethical situation, it's especially in medicine, it's unlikely that a priori, you can come into that situation knowing in it what values are in play and that every single value that's in play is contained on your list. Okay, so let me see if I've got this right. So we've got a, a general approach in the AI ethics world where we say, hey, here are the values that we develop, design, deploy AI with. And there's a, while the lists vary across the, you know, 150, 200 plus organizations, there's a Venn diagram with lots of overlap around things like justice or fairness, privacy, human in the loop, which is a weird thing to value. Anyway, I'll put mm -hmm. that to the side. Uh, respect for persons, respect for autonomy, blah, blah, blah. So you get this list. There's three main problems that you've articulated. One is something like uh, the, the value specified at that abstract level underdetermines what actually ought to be done in a given situation, even when you know the value applies. So Not only that, that but, but different people are going to interpret the values differently. Sure, right. Different people will apply it differently. And so then there's an open question about what constitutes the best or at least the appropriate or at least the not inappropriate application of that generic value to the case at hand. So that's, that's something right. like an under, underdetermination problem. Second problem is something like, uh, what do you do when those values conflict? They're, the principles themselves don't tell you what to do when those values conflict or the values themselves right. don't tell you. Exactly. And so there's this open question about how do we appropriately balance or not inappropriately balance these things in different kinds of contexts. And the third one is something like, I sort of heard you say two things. One is that there's a kind of ignorance that we have to grapple with when you come to a case. The case is complex, like social robots in, in elderly healthcare, and you're like, wait, what are even, is justice an issue here? So there's, an, there's a question as to what values are at play. But then there's a second related one I thought I heard you say, which was something like, we might not know whether our list of values is exhaustive in articulating the entire space of ethical possibility or something along those That's, lines. That's, yeah. It's, so, not, a, it's yeah. not an exhaustive list of the ethical world. Yeah, here's the thing, yeah, is you can't have an exhaustive list. Right. It, Cause an exhaust, I mean, you, maybe you could. So I went with one of my classes, I had this, let, let's list all the values that we can think of. Yeah. And, and we came up with like, I think it was like 36. Right. So you can imagine like the organization says, no, no, we're going to include all the values on the list. Well, that was completely impractical. Right. So, so yes, oh, yeah, it's, like those, it's, it's, it's like those idiotic lists where people are like, oh, we've discovered 137 human biases. It's like, what the hell are you got to do with all this giant pie chart of 137 human buys. Now you're going to go through and procedurally go, you know, one through 137. Did yeah. we manifest this bias? Did we manifest that bias? Then, then you have to check to see if, if in applying any of those biases and checking to see whether you were subject to any of those biases, you were biased in that judgment by 137 and then so on ad infinitum. So there's like this ridiculous, like cottage industry of like listing all the biases in a way that's completely impossible to operationalize, completely impossible to layer into procedure. Yeah, and, and this is exactly the point, is that 
the people who are the decision makers need like it's uh, like practical processes and, and a, a practical list. Like they, they have to make the, the problem practical. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And a list of 37 values, like you, how is, how's yeah. it going to help <laughs> yeah. you? It's, it's going to make it yeah. worse. And the other, but the other, but the problem also runs the other way, which is okay. Well, you can't have too many values. Let's constrain to like the most important values like that, where the Venn diagrams agree. Right. So let's have four principles. So let's have five principles. Sure. Right? Sure. You can manage that. The problem is you go into the situation with the list, you're tacitly excluding, you're assuming that everything, all the ethical issues are going to, it's got to fall covered that by that list. Yeah. 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 Of course you can say, say, no, this list is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Of course there are other values, but the thing is by walking in there with the list, you're going to be attending to certain values much more than other values. So the example I always use is the value of caring, right? Mm. So. On none of those lists does the value of caring come up. But certainly in medicine, we think that caring is important. So yeah. people are, are deciding, should we have these social robots in elderly care homes? I mean, for me, like the most important question <laughs> is not like autonomy. It's mm. does this create an environment of caring or does it detract from an environment of caring? Because oh, ultimately that's, that's what we want. Yeah. But if it's not on the list, it's very easy to miss. Yeah. And related yeah. to this problem is who is deciding which list to use, right? Yeah. And it's probably going to be hospital administrators and maybe some doctors. Yeah. And so we're going to, again, we're constraining the scope of values that we're considering in the decision. So, the, yeah, okay, wait, there, there's a bunch of th things going on that I think are super interesting. One is that I think some of this has to be exactly right. And I've seen large companies come up with these lists where, so one company I have in particular, very, you know, multi-billion dollar company in countless countries, they've got their framework for AI ethics, and they have the usual suspects like privacy and transparency and explainability, fairness, justice, and then they have this sort of safe safety as one of the values. Yeah. And I said something like, hey, where do you put something like potentially undermines democratic institutions? So, you know, just where would you put that? And they were like, safety? And, you know, where would you put causes anxiety? Uh, that'd go under safety too. So safety just became this massive grab bag of all the things that can go ethically wrong that are not in the other categories. <laughs> so in other, and which, which renders it completely, completely useless. The other thing, and I wonder if this is the direction in which you're going, you know, you could come up with a list and I've done this before, you know, categories that are meant to exhaust the the ethical space that there is, the logical space of ethical rights and wrongs. And I've done this in conjunction with other philosophers. And we've come up with a list. And, you know, here's, you know, I put it into like six or seven categories, something like that. But one thing that I realized is that when we hear things like mental mental or psychological harm, trained philosophers, trained ethicists, there's lots of stuff that they're thinking about. So if you ask a philosopher Think about the ways in which people can become emotionally harmed in this context. We'll think of a billion and one. But, you know, the non-ethicists, the people who don't have, who haven't trained for this kind of thing in decades, they might think of like one or two things. And so a list to a philosopher might be more, you know, one list in the hands of, of say, a, a trained ethicist is going to be different than that list in the hands of a nurse or a doctor. And so yeah. then I start thinking, maybe it's not the list, it's the people wielding the lists, and we need ethicists involved somehow. Is that Great. the direction so that, that you're going in? Yeah. So the the framework that we offer that kind of addresses these shortcomings for principalism is what we call participatory deliberative conservatism. They have to say that five times fast. Catchy. Yeah, it's very catchy. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so here's the thing, right? So it's participatory in the sense that the decision makers are drawn from a broad group of stakeholders. Okay, it's not just a, a group of doctors and physicians that have to satisfy a safety commission, uh, a data privacy commission. It includes patients, it includes nurses, it includes, you know, possibly caretakers. Anybody who is going to be causally affected in some kind of significant way by this technology. Okay, so that's the first step, it's participatory. Sure. The, se the second part of it. And sorry, is quick question. This, 
Yeah. This this framework that you're articulating, this sort of a criteria by which you come to decisions, this is about whether it's ethical to deploy or whether yes. and how to deploy a particular AI or robotic solution in a particular use case, right? So exactly. it's, it's highly contextualized. Okay. Yes. So step it's, one, get a bunch of people involved, bring together relevant stakeholders. Yeah. So this is, we call this the pilot committee. So you have a pilot committee. It's yep. made up of elements of these diverse groups. Okay. But it's not going to be, the, the pilot committee can't be so large that it's unwieldy. Okay. Sure. Yeah. You know, some people say like, um, oh, we need data science teams that are representative of, you know, the diversity of humanity. And I think are you going to get like 175 data scientists? <laughs> like you're, you're going yeah. to get a white dude, a black man, a black woman, a Vietnamese woman, a Vietnamese man, a, you know, Cambodian man. A Cam like there's too much diversity. You can't have it all. So yeah, it's yes. going to have to be suitably, suitably constrained. Yeah. Suitably constrained. Right. And then, so then in, in the first stage, this is the, the thing they, they just articulate. So first there, there are two decisions that have to be made. The first is whether to adopt the technology at all. And then once they decided to adopt the technology, they have to decide how they're going to adopt the technology. Mm -hmm. In the first stage, they just kind of articulate their, their concerns and their values in a specific way. Not like, oh, I am worried about beneficence. No, like in very. Like the, the way normal people talk, right? Like a nurse might say in the, in this case of social robots, I'm worried that I won't get enough face-to-face -face time with patients if we have mm -hmm. a robot in there with them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're going to do this in a way that normal human beings talk about value, not the way <laughs> philosophers talk about value. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and that's the first step. And then we're going to do, we're going to use like a variety of social science techniques that are appropriate to that, that context to broaden our sample. So now we're going to go to the rest of the nurses in the institution and we're going to have like, you know, survey techniques or structured interviews or sure. whatever, whatever's appropriate to the situation. Right. And also like, you know, caretakers or patient populations get some feedback, you know, this is what we're thinking about doing. What are your thoughts? What are your concerns? And then we enter the deliberative component because it's not enough for, for people to say, I want, right? Mm -hmm. This is one thing. So as we haven't mentioned this yet, but I'm a clinical ethicist, right? So I work face to face with patients and patients ask for all manner of things that are not medically appropriate. And they are certainly not sensitive to cost when it's a third party payer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so. We need a deliberative element where we take these hyper-specific concerns that are articulated in a colloquial way, right? And we identify, okay, what is the value underlying that? Like, what value is this an instantiation of, right? So okay. the nurse that says, well, I'm worried I'm not going to get enough face-to-face -face time with my patient, right? They are articulating a concern for the value of caring. So one of the techniques that we learn in biomedical mediation is people will have to articulate, you know, their complaints and what they're really doing is articulating values, but in a highly specific way. But what you want to do is identify kind of like the, the mid-level value. So not like beneficence or respect for autonomy, but what's the mid-level value? And here's the cool thing. When you identify the mid-level value that they're actually concerned about, there are many ways to instantiate that value. And the mistake people make is they get fixated, right? I, I, I need face-to-face -face time with my patient. But what they really are worried about is that we're detracting from a caring environment, right? But there's more to, more to one way to do that. And so once we identify the underlying value, we can find different ways to achieve that different end. So, okay, so that's interesting. So is that a place where you think something like ethicists make yes. sense? Um, this because, is because this is what we're trained to do. So that's interesting. It's interesting because, you know, when I think about ethicists helping to engage in deliberation, I think about professors in the classroom. Uh, I think, you know, I've taught medical ethics dozens of times and we talk, you know, talked about abortion and euthanasia. And, you know, I take it that part of my job was to facilitate that conversation, point out that this person raised a certain kind of objection to a premise that the other person articulated. And it's, a, it's you know, abstract philosophical, you know, reasoning about, you know, arguments. But what's interesting is that 
what you're pointing out is that ethicists are particularly good at ferreting out the underlying values behind the kind of very concrete complaints that people make, that there there's a way in which they could abstract from the particulars that mm. the person... So I won't be able to get to see... I won't be able to care for my patient. I won't be able to get to see my patient one-on-one. -on -one. And the philosopher is going to start asking things like, well, what makes it important for you to, to see your patient one-on-one? -on -one? Well, you know... Because that's how I care for them. That's how I make sure that they're okay. Okay, so what you really are concerned about is making sure that they're cared for, that you're caring for them in the right way. Yes. Okay, are there ways you can do that while still having decreased time? Well, I don't see how. And then, but if they say, I don't see how, that already means I take it. If you could show them how, they might be open to that alternate course of action because it's still a way of, of making sure that their value of caring for that person is realized. Exactly right. Exactly right. And so this is, because what we have is we have diverse stakeholders with different values and different concerns, right? And so what we need to do is find a way to reconcile them. Yeah. And the only way we're going to reconcile them is if we do this work of identifying the underlying value, right? And, and, and because that gives us ways of compromising or um, achieving that same value in different ways. And so that's the deliberative component. And can you say something about why they're, you characterize them as mid-level values? What are mid-level values? And what, what, maybe if I understood what exactly those are, I'd get a clear picture of what deliberative role they're playing that the abstract appeals to justice and respect yeah. or autonomy don't do. So yeah, what are these mid-level values? Yeah, so I take mid-level values to be stuff like privacy, feeling cared for, like all these things, I think you can kind of squish them into beneficence and respect for autonomy. So like privacy, people say, is derived from respect from autonomy, yeah. feeling like a sense of belonging. Maybe like squish that into beneficence, right? Right. But, but when we talk about like just beneficence or respect for autonomy, it's too vague and abstract to really mm. give us practical guidance on what to do. So what if I said something like mid-level values are ways of realizing higher level or higher order value. So ways of respecting people's autonomy include respecting their privacy. I don't know, n not overstepping the bounds in terms of what you want versus helping them to understand what they want. So it's, it's ways of realizing those values. That's yes. mid-level value. That's right. But okay. they're more tractable and they're more understandable to, you know, non-philosophers and everyday people. Right. And so what you're really abstracting from are those I think you're abstracting to those mid-level values from their concrete, like, I'm not going to see my patient enough. That's right. Exactly right. Okay, so we've got this framework whose name is so well-branded, I forgot it already, but it's deliberative. <laughs> no, sorry. What was the first one? It was sort of the Participatory, sort of deliberative, yeah, just... conservatism. And we haven't talked about the, the conservatism Let's part Let's get to yet. conservatism, yeah. Okay, so the conservatism is this. So I think of medical ethics like a constitutional democracy. Right. So the people, they can have some say in the laws by which they are governed, but they can't choose any laws. The laws that they choose are constrained by the Constitution. Okay. And the same goes to medical ethics. Patients can ask for any kind of care they want, but we're not obligated to provide care that conflicts with the core medical values. Okay. Can you give an example of that? Yeah. So a patient can't ask for care that will be medically futile mm -hmm. or that would cause the reasonably foreseeable more harm than benefit to the patient. Okay. Okay. They can ask for it. Sure. You can ask, sure. but there's but no you... duty to provide it. Or a doctor could justifiably decline that to perform that or to provide that That's kind of right. treatment. That's right. The way I, the way I put it is, we're not Burger King. <laughs> right, right. You um, can't have it your way. That's the joke. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, but the, the, but there's another important reason for the conservatism, which is that even though patients and their caregivers will be affected by the choices that construct the care environment. It is the hospital administrators and the doctors 
that they, that bear the moral and legal responsibility for the consequences of those decisions. And so that's what gives administrators and doctors the authority to say no to certain wishes from uh, the patient uh, stakeholder group. So what's, what is being conserved in the conservatism? Well, adherence to the regulatory and established legal norms of the medical profession. Okay. Yeah. But again, you know, going back to the constitutional analogy, right? We can change the constitution. It's just hard and it takes a lot of work and it happens slowly over time. So the regulatory framework and the medical, you know, ethical norms can change over time. They're not, you know, stuck forever. Okay. So big picture, the idea is we've got these high level principles, fairness or justice and privacy and transparency and respect for autonomy, blah, blah, beneficence. And they're kind of useless for the three reasons that were articulated. They're, they they mm-hmm. they underspecify, they come into conflict, and they don't exhaust all the the kinds of ethical issues that you might confront. Those are the three. And then the idea is so what we need instead is first we just need non philosophers, just sort of the people on the ground, the people involved, doctors, nurses, patients, family of patients, etc. Maybe insurance people are supposed to have a voice. I don't know. The, get the relevant stakeholders. They're supposed to participate in a conversation about whether we should adopt this technology what, and if we should adopt it, how should we deploy it? Although I imagine that's going to be some gray area there. Like we should adopt it on the condition that we deploy it in such and such a way. Yeah, sure. We shouldn't yep. adopt it otherwise. That's right. Yeah. And that's sort of part one of the process that you want to introduce, bringing these people together. Part two of the process is not just a new process, but a new person, an ethicist. I think this is what you're pointing to. You want an ethicist in the process to help uncover, reveal the underlying values behind the people who are engaged in, in some cases anyway, reasonable disagreement about whether to deploy or how to deploy. And by ferreting ferreting out those underlying values, there can be a sort of kind of a negotiation on what can be done, but it's not a compromising values. It's figuring out different ways that people can still realize their values, even if it wasn't in the way that they originally thought that they had to. Yeah. And I think it's helpful to go back to the three criticisms of the principalist approach that motivate this, right? So remember one of the problems with principalism is that it underspecifies the values, right? We want the interpretation of those values to harmonize with the understanding of those values of the people who are subject to the decisions. Right. So it does no good for the people in Omaha, you know, but they have one conception of justice and then like, but applied to their situation is a conception of justice that is completely foreign to them. Right. So the people subject to the decisions, it is their understanding of those moral norms that should be used. Right. That's the first thing. So that solves the ambiguity problem. Right. So how do we understand justice in this case? Well, it's, it's, we understand it in the way that the people who are subject to this decision understand it. That's how, right? The second problem is the ranking challenge. Well, according to what criteria do we rank these various values that are in play here, right? And it has to be non ad hoc. You can't just, in one situation, rank them one way, in another situation, rank them another way, right? And have no justification for that difference in rankings. Sure. Well, what, ju- what justifies it is the deliberative process by the people who are subject to the decision. Right? They're the ones that ranked it that way. It, and it, it is justified because they're the ones subject to the effects of that decision. Right? And then... Okay, so... Brian, so, so Sorry, go ahead. So, okay. Principles, we need more meat on the bones. And we need to know how to apply the values in cases that conflict. And the deliberative, the communal or participatory deliberative process and get, it creates that further specification and creates, ideally anyway, the grounds on which to weigh one value as more important than another in a given case. And presumably yes. you want something like consistency of the application of those values across various use cases. So you can use previous use cases to say, well, we ranked them this way in this case. We should do the same thing in this case because 
it's it's sufficiently similar to the previous case such that we should come to the same conclusion? Yes and no. So you could have the same technology deployed in different ways in two different locations. Why? Mm -hmm. Because the way people in Manhattan will rank those values is going to be different from the way people in Japan rank those values. Right. right? Sure. But that's what justifies the different rankings, right? It's not ad hoc. Right. It's not, you didn't flip a coin. It's deployed differently because the people on the ground who will be affected by these things hold different values, different norms. And so it's, exactly. shaped, by, it's shaped by those facts. Yep. And another kind of piece of the puzzle here is like, if you've read any literature, especially like different medical boards, you know, you always hear the terms patient-centered care, shared decision-making, right? Mm -hmm. And really what we're doing is we're extending those ideas to the care environment itself. Because as you know, AI fundamentally changes the way that we relate to each other. And, and it's going to change the sorts of choices we have available to us in the medical context, right? So why wouldn't we apply that same mentality to decisions about the care environment itself? So that's why the participatory element, you know, insists on bringing the patient into the deliberative process. And there's another virtue to our approach that I want to highlight, which is its epistemic virtues, right? So healthcare environments and institutions are extremely complex systems. And we know, let's actually, let's speak a little wonky here and think about Hayek, right? Hayek's the information problem. So. His whole point was in complex systems, you can't have only a small cadre of decision makers at the top making decisions about the economy because they don't have access to the information at the ground level for what's sure. going on. And so what does a participatory approach do? It solves the knowledge problems that complex systems have, right? So if you bring in nurses and caregivers and patients, you get the information that only they have that administrators don't have. Right. So that's part of why you want the participatory. It's not merely for the varying ethical views, but it's for the, just the on-the-ground insights that different people have. Yeah. And as you know, with AI, there are always unintended consequences, right? Yeah. We can mitigate some of those if we have more and better information. Yeah, that's fair. Let me, let me push back on just one thing. So this all seems totally reasonable to me. I mean, I'm on board with thinking that just listing a bunch of principles doesn't do much. I'm on board with thinking if you just give a list of principles to some data scientists, for instance, or just a bunch of doctors, a bunch of nurses, they're not really going to know what to do with that thing. In the hands of a philosopher who's been trained, a trained ethicist, yeah, it means something to them. But that's because the, but at that point, the list is sort of, it's just like an extra thing that we might use. We, but we never actually, no ethicist, no, you know, you know self-respecting ethicist. Where's my list? Where's my list? Exactly. I can't do it without the list. Exactly. No one, no one, no decent philosopher goes has this sort of <laughs> list. It's ridiculous. And so if we have to sort of dumb it down to a list, then no one, the people who are using that list are not going to be able to use the thing. It's just not going to be plausible that they can use it. So I'm on board with that. And, you know, I've written elsewhere things like, we need something like institute, what I something akin to institutional review boards, something like IRBs or something like ethics committees in hospitals, in order to, yeah, deploy and design and deploy in an ethically safe way. Okay, fine. But one problem you might think is that, and this is especially with the participatory thing. I don't stress the participatory thing because I see it seems to me to be hard to scale. Right? If you're talking about it's a single hospital, they you know. They're not dealing with so many crazy ethically complex cases that, you know, there's a relevant team that could take care of it. You can get the stakeholders in a room more or less quick enough. But if, you know, you're a really large, let's say like you're an organization that has, you know, you yeah, own okay, hundreds of hospitals or yeah, Kaiser or Permanente system. or something. Exactly. So how do you, is this really, is it plausible to scale this approach, I suppose is the question? I think there are limits to its scalability because it is by design for local deployment decisions. Hmm. And so, you know, what I would counsel Kaiser Permanente, if they find my paper and say, hey, let's do this. Yeah. I would say you might consider doing this approach, not for your whole system, but by region. Because mm -hmm. you'll capture regional values. 
right? Or if a particular hospital, you know, serves a distinct population, yeah, cultural population, then you might want to restrict it, the deployment decision to that yeah. group. I mean, yes, I, I mean, I see that as being as, you know, a, a respectable move, but part of me is just thinking about the pace at which AI is getting developed and deployed. That I, I don't know. I don't know that they have the time in certain, you know, certain cases, yes, but the time to get the part, the, it's the participants that are the problem. It's, it's sort of like culling together those participants and getting their insights and their moral views. You know, it takes work, even if you're doing, you know, you're doing structured interviews, even if you're doing surveys. I mean, just to write the survey and to get it out and to get people to respond mm -hmm. and to analyze the survey and then to discuss the findings. I mean, this takes a bunch of time. And if you're talking about if a healthcare system is taking on dozens and dozens, of, at least just for now, dozens of AI applications, you know, a month or a quarter, you know, a hundred a year, whatever it is. And I'm not just thinking about today, but I'm thinking about, you know, next year and the year after. How can they possibly keep up with that pace? And then that suggests to me, and maybe I'm wrong about this, the participatory stuff is going to have to take a back seat, and we're just going to have to have some other way of substituting for the, the, the actual participants. And then my thought is, and maybe this is, I don't know, too philosopher-centric or something like that, you're going to have to have ethicists who are good at thinking about the different kinds of stakeholders and how they might get ethically, ethically wronged in various ways. I, th I think this is a great criticism. I have not heard this criticism before. I think, I think you're right that as the pace of technological adoption accelerates, it's going to be increasingly difficult to employ this process. So in my view, what that means is we, we just need to choose carefully about when we deploy, maybe we can't deploy this process for all decisions, right? Maybe like when we're deploying an AI system for like the, the billing function or something like this, or, you know, physician's note, note taker or something. Sure. We don't need uh, patient input. So I guess right, like right. what we want to maybe restrict this to is when patient care is going to change significantly or the kinds of interactions that patients have with staff is going to change significantly. Mm -hmm. Then this is the, the, the place where this process is appropriate. But it doesn't mean that every decision to deploy AI has to run through the process. Yeah, I mean, that sounds right. I mean, you know, in, I, I would say something like in high-risk cases, maybe you would need something like the participatory, the participatory part of the framework. Um, patient care or direct patient care seems to me a subset of those high-risk cases. Uh, I'm sure there, there are other, I'm sure there are other kinds of high risk. I mean, just automated ways of cataloging and, uh, you know, as it were, submitting the appropriate codes to the insurance companies, you know, on the basis of which people get approved or denied care. Now that's high risk, but it's not, you know, it's not doctors and nurses talking to patients or something like that. So, and then the question is really in some sense an empirical question. What's the quantity of high risk cases that are going to come across, say, a Kaiser Permanente or something along those lines? And is it is that number low enough such that we can get participants involved in every high risk case, or is the number just too high that the particip participatory stuff is just not plausible? Yeah, I think this is a great line of thought, and maybe something that maybe I'll want to write about. <laughs> I like this. Great. So let me just offer this. This is what MD Anderson does, where I work. We have a standing group of volunteers that are former patients or families of former patients, families of, of current patients, and they're a standing group of volunteers that volunteer for a two-year period to take surveys and give feedback and just be the, and patient advocates, I should say, and to be the patient voice when we do research on quality improvement types and quality assessment. And so I, maybe this is like a call to other hospitals to adopt this model, especially, you know, public hospitals mm -hmm. is that, you know, you need to develop this kind of infrastructure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that'd be reasonable. I mean, you know, it might be the case that the framework works really well on a small scale and there's plenty of opportunities for this kind of framework to do a ton of good. And then there's a separate question about, you know, how, how much can it be scaled? And there, is there a point at which it breaks? Yeah. 
I think that's a perfectly legitimate concern. Yeah. Cool. Well, this is super interesting. I, I really, I mean, I thought this was really interesting. It's really interesting in particular to see the way that you think of the role that ethicists have to play. I don't think it's a way that I'd, may, maybe it was implicit in the way that I've thought about it before, but I think, you know, the way that you articulated it is really clear. Anyway, so yeah, I, I thought this was, this was really great. Thanks so much. Thank you. Pleasure.